Thanks so much for having us here. Uh, thanks to Gensler, the space, and everyone for coming out so early. Um, Kim and Kyle for setting this all up. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Great. Keep the shouting coming, it's all Keep right. Keep the shouting. It's early, so uh, you know we usually have our creative afternoons and relaxing mornings, but not today. So I'm just gonna switch this out really quick. So what we'll do is we'll just talk a little bit about our studio for people that aren't familiar with it. And then what we're going to do is talk about uh, the topic this month, which is money. Um, so we started Plural in 2008. This is uh, myself on the right here and my partner Renata on the left. And we have one employee, Alexa, who is um, dizzy with birds around her head. And she's not our design child as this looks, um, but she's our employee and she's fantastic and um, you know we couldn't do everything we do without her. So like I said, we, um, we started in 2008 and we focus on typography as Kim had mentioned and also creating um, all sorts of different projects, but when we started we really started to think about rather than just focusing on typography and strong concept and visual imagery and things like that, uh, it's about pursuing meaningful projects. And so that's really has been the biggest shift in the studio over the past four or five years now, um, is to think about what it means to make design and what it means to do what you do and be creative and how that impact um, happens. So we work on a wide range of uh, media, print, web, installation, sound, interactive. And we do that for a lot of cultural institutions in the city and uh, some outside of the city, mostly focusing, like I said, with artists, musicians, uh, arts institutions, educational institutions, people that we believe in and that we want to support and uh, pursuing projects that we believe in and want to support as well. And with them, we've done all sorts of different projects. Now our focus has started to transition a little bit more into the realm of uh, doing installations and um, art projects and um, you know things that aren't traditionally thought of as a in in a traditional print graphic design studio. Money. <laughs> That's what it says. So the topic was money for all of the creative mornings, I believe, right? All across, just this month. oh, it's just this month. But across right, but across. across. So everyone's talking about money. <laughs> and when Kim brought this up to us, I was like, money? What, money? And, and so I thought about it. Well, it's like, I put this up here. It's not because we can't spell. <laughs> it's because we don't care about money. Now let me explain that a little bit. It's, it's of course, we, we work in a field in which like, you know, it's a commercial art industry. So money is involved and you have to um, have it to survive and, and keep going. But it's not the focus of our studio and we found it to be problematic if we thought about our goal um, is to make money. If we're, if we're out there to go make money, then we're probably in the wrong field. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. But so right, very early on, we decided that money was not the priority. If the priority was money, we would be closed in the first week or first month. We had no money when we started. We were graduate students graduating um, on a two-year program, so no money at all involved. And Jeremiah said, let's open a studio when we knew right away we were going to not survive for maybe a year or six months. I told him, we're not going to make any money on the first six months. I already know that. And he said, let's do it. <laughs> so we already knew we wanted to pursue the projects we were Let's find the right projects and maybe money will follow. That was our sort of strategy if we had one. Right, so, so I think a lot of this is the idea of it being problematic because oftentimes you 
come into a situation, well, like always, you come into a situation where you run out of your budget and the work isn't done yet or you're not done exploring and researching. Because a lot of what we do is we're interested in the practice, in, in the design as a practice and evolving these ideas and doing research and, and exploration and being fucking weird and um, doing, you know, following your intuition and having fun. And so if we are in a moment in which you have to stop working or stop that train because if you run out of money, then it's like the work is going to suffer. And really, that's not something that we're interested in doing. And we wouldn't have started a business if we wanted to just uh, you know, end these projects without giving it our all. So the, fo the point of it is that you know, how can we continue to push ourselves and do the things that we're interested in, in learning and growing and, and saying, you know, even if we're out of budget and this project isn't um, through yet, let's keep going and make this the best that we can we can do because we've already invested so much time into it, so much effort, so much uh, creativity and thinking that it would it would do the work a disservice, it would do us a disservice, and it would do the client a disservice to stop it. And it's our name on the project. We we want to stand behind it as much as we can. Right. So what we'll do then is share with you. Um, I know the time is short; it's you know 20 so minutes, but we're just going to blow through a bunch of projects. All of these projects that we're sharing with you are projects that we've done for free. No exchange of money yeah. involved. Um, which it was kind of funny because I was selecting through and going, and it's like selected free projects. Yeah. Like we've done that many for free yeah. that we can't fit them into a 20 minute chunk. Um, but also what we'll share with you is some newer projects that we're doing that are a little bit outside of um, client work and things that we're doing with people, um, things that we're exploring on our own. Because a lot of what happens in the studio is bringing those ideas or interests that you are pursuing outside of design into the studio that then infiltrate the client work and the daily practice and whatever it is that you're doing. So we emphasize that and everyone that works with us, um, it's always they have to be, um, they have to have interest outside of design. And I talk about that weird thing a lot because I think about it a lot. Not, not in the sense that um, we are trying to be weird, but I think the notion is that uh, it makes, to be uncomfortable, you know, weird from us is new. It's a new experience, it's, it's a new idea. And so if you're looking at a bunch of designs, and I, I only mention that because I typed it up there and it just sort of came out. But when we're in the studio looking at different projects, my tendency is to always pick the one that I like the least because I think there's something there. There's something weird about it that I'm uncomfortable with. So let's pursue that and see what we can do with it. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but I say that to you all the time. Yeah, Jeremiah likes that word a lot, weird. Let's go with the weird one. But I, I think that Sometimes uh, the weird one is not the best one, but if you're uncomfortable, there's something there. If it makes your, if you have a feeling in your gut, you should listen to it. That I think that's what you, you're trying to say. Like you, you felt a punch. That's the one. Yeah. So Lumpen Magazine is a uh, free quarterly magazine. We actually have yeah. um, a stack, probably not enough for everybody, so we have to fight over them. But you can also find them at like Quimby's or other uh, local bookstores st on, on the floor. And it, it's, outside the it's door. really nice because this is a free publication. They make no money on this. Uh, the uh, Ed, who runs the magazine, uh, does the whole thing by himself. And he has a lot of people involved. And he's been doing this for a long time. Yeah, over, 20, over well, 20 21 years, years now. So. This is what Lumpen looks like uh, before we, we sort of took it over and started working with Ed four years ago. So it's been going on for, like I said, 20, uh, this will be the 21st year. And Ed came to us one day, Ed Marzuski, who I work with on this, and does a, a, just a giant number of projects in the city. Um, and he said to me, well, I'm going to redesign Lumpen, and I'm working on this, and I've been working with this designer, and we're going to you know, it has to go out to print tomorrow. So I wanted, you know, to get your advice on something. And I was like, okay, well, what's going on? And he's like, well, the designer that d was supposed to do this hasn't done anything yet. He dropped the ball. So I think I'm going to just do it tonight and send it out to print. What do you think? I was like, Ed, you're fucking crazy. 
that's a horrible idea. You're going to re-release this magazine and redesign it in one night, send it to print, and hope that it's better than it was. You're just going to kill this magazine. How about you, uh, you know, how about you think about this for a second? So I said, give us the files and give us a week, and let's try to turn this thing around. Rethink about what it is. So I got to the uh, studio one day, and Jeremiah said, I got us a magazine. <laughs> and I said, that's amazing. And then he said, we have a week, <laughs> and we're not going to make any money. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, but the designer already started it. And I said, okay, let's see what he has. And there was one spread on the page, <laughs> on the document, one spread. No, none of the content was there. Nothing was there. And I said, what? what? Okay, I think it's going to be fun. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so uh, that, and, and he said, oh, we're going to change the format too. Everything was new. We had to pick type sizes typefaces, grid, whatever. It, you have a week. Do it. Go do it. Yeah, so, so with that, you know, we started to really think about it. We have to give this thing a new identity, a new life, and, and sort of revitalize what this uh, magazine exists as. You know, it hosts culture, politics, uh, art, um, music, um, just things in Chicago, all sorts of things. And when I was talking to Ed about it, he was like, well, I think I have to just keep putting this magazine out because the kids these days need some propaganda. They need some, <laughs> you know, some fucked up magazine that, that changes the way they think That's about free. things. Yeah, and they have to be able to get their hands on it. So I need to keep doing this in the interest of the uh, youth. Um, so we thought about the logo uh, previously and then what, what it meant. You know, Lumpen, it's sort of like a collection of things that don't always go together. Um, and so we wanted to think about this the mark that way too is just like here's some pieces they might not all go together but they kind of work in a way where um, you know you're gonna get something unexpected in the magazine each time um, so here's the first three covers that we did for it and we sort of relaunched this and you see on the left like you know we, we gave Ed um, we we're like here it is here's the new thing here's a new logo he's like what is that a dead dead bird on the cover I was like yeah that's the old magazine and the yellow Sun is the new one so, um, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. I have to say, we actually did the uh, whole interior of the magazine before we got to the logo, and I think that was a really smart decision looking back, because we had to really learn about what Lumpen was to really understand uh, and, and get to a point where we could even start thinking about a mark. And the, the thing that when we did the mark, Jeremiah said, this is really weird. And that was the one that we said, okay, that's the one. See, even before I was into weird, it was happening. <laughs> so here's the issue of the 20-year uh, volume, which basically was a collection um, reprinting a lot of the um, stories from previous issues and sort of mashing them all together onto one cover. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving forward a little bit faster and just okay, show you some, some spreads spread. yeah, from the inside. So when we get these, we still, you know, it's funny, after spending one week to do sort of the entire redesign and rebranding of this magazine, now um, we're expected to do it always in a week or less. So in a way, it's, it's a really great exercise for us because when it comes into the studio, there's no time to think about it. And oftentimes, um, the, the stories, they come with no imagery. So it's really up to us to, to spend some time, read the article, think about what it means, develop imagery, uh, either typographically or pho uh, photograph-based, or whatever it is, to try to highlight what the story is about in each one. And because it goes in and out so fast, it becomes sort of an exercise of our intuition, design intuition. It's like, you know, we're going to just set a grid and set a type, but then everything else is fair game, and just go through it, get into the story, and blow some stuff out really fast. So the way we work through this magazine is we, we take the articles and just divide it up and then Jeremiah will start from the front and I'll start from the back or the other way around. Yeah, that and was then once we, uh, once we have maybe a day worth, worth of work, we print them all out and we start looking at the spreads and seeing how we can pull things together on the issue. And then at the end, we just rearrange all the spreads to, to see if we have a good pacing. Yeah, so it's kind of like, the, you know, like a, a reality design TV show without the TV 
or film cameras or anything. It's just really fast. You just and then have we to call move. Ed and say, can we cut this article? It's too long. Yeah. So this is the uh, last issue that, that you'll see over there. It's the uh, all comics issue. And what we did was just spend some time um, cutting out people's comics and collaging them into this cover. So here's another book that we do um, also for Ed is called Mash Tun. And it's a craft beer journal um, that comes out twice a year and um, just basically talks about craft beer and different um, breweries and interviews with craft beer makers and things like that. Um, Another project for Ed. Yeah, I know, right? So you're See, when you start seeing a theme working here. for Ed for free, he really likes it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say, though, a lot of these projects, interestingly enough, have led us to some of our biggest client work, you know, and, and they're seeing these, this sort of, um, I don't know actually how it's happening, but I remember we were working for uh, the Bar Association. No, we and were working for the ABA, American Bar Association, yeah. and they said, we saw your work for Lumpen Magazine at Communication Arts, and yeah. we want you to redesign our magazine. And we said, what? It makes no sense. It's like lawyers are reading this smut? Really? And then we, we actually went through the interview process and this lady said, I, with the work on your website, it's really interesting, but I can't navigate it. No. It's broken. And we said, no, no, it is just a little weird, but if you it's can get broken. past that. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Anyways, um, Midway Fair is a fair that happens uh, also twice a year and was started in 2011. Um, and it's a collaboration between a few arts institutions, uh, smaller galleries in the city, Roots and Culture, Public Media Institute, and Three Walls. And it's basically um, an art, uh, art fair that hosts independent spaces and smaller, um, smaller galleries and things like that all into one thing. So with them, we developed an identity and typographic system that then plays out through all of the uh, collateral and materials that you see in the design. Um, and really, we thought about the logo as we we're developing it as just like, well, it's midway. It's in between. It's sort of in between um, you know, in the location that it's in the Midwest. And it's also in between sort of uh, an artist and the giant cultural institutions. It's, it was very much thinking about that. And then to say, how can we design a, a typographic system that's flexible enough where everything looks like it, it's very um, active and dynamic without what still is very, very structured. So if you see it, basically what it is is that you have a number of iterations of the way that the type can work. And you can, it all starts you know, right here with uh, the top left and can either be just the inlines, um, just the outs, or the full thing, or a mixture. Or you can of. mix them up, which is fun. Right. So right there is a mix. So the first uh, year that we did it, it was it was uh, visual arts landing in Chicago. So we took that theme very literally and um, had some photographs of artists that we worked with uh, Sandra Miller um, to take on you know, these artists bouncing on trampolines to get them sort of literally landing in Chicago, falling from the sky. Um, and so here's a few of those. And then I'll just briefly show you uh, this second, year's as well. Year, yeah. So this year we did the same thing. So if you look at the typographic system, it, it didn't change that much. But you know the colors changed, and everything is still based on the same uh, structure. And it sort of has a different life now, just from flipping you know the colors or the way you're using the type and the things. Um, this year it was a really great fair, and I was really excited because it was the first time that I got to come and interact with our work in a space, and I was like. All the work is totally trashed. I'm finding it, you know, in the porta potties and on the floor, and there's footprints all over it, and it still looks pretty good. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah. So, so now it's actually that it has inspired me a lot. I'm like, I want to see the work kind of destroyed and see how it lives, lives in the real world. So, let's see. We're about yeah, I can talk about the STA. So, uh, the STA is. Um, I'll let you guys read a little bit, but it's an organization in Chicago. It has a lot of heritage, and they run this uh, thing called the Archive 
and it's a, basically a design competition for local graphic designers. And the, the difference is really this idea of the aspect of being local. And they approached us last year to do the identity of the archive, and we thought it was a little bit confusing already because it's the SBA, but it's the archive, and it's a competition, and why do they have all these different identities? But we wanted to work with them, and they said, oh, we really want a theme. And we said, oh, it's gonna, it might be too much to have a theme and an identity, and it's the archive, and it's the SBA. So we said, what? let's forget about this idea of theme, and let's see what what we can do with, uh, with this idea of Chicago archive and typography, which is the Society of Typographic Arts. So we, we looked at, and we asked our friend Jackson, who's in the audience, for some help on this. We asked him, um, we were looking for typefaces that were, had a relationship to the city, that were created in the city or by people that lived in the city, and we made a collection of these typefaces. And then we started combining them and overlapping them to create this idea of archiving. So uh, we developed this, the identity is based on the overlapping of these typefaces. So it brings you this, this uh, reference to the city without seeing the city. And then on the right hand side, we actually blew out uh, the number 12 because it was archive 12. So we would have this, um, a little bit of a, a candy poster on the, on the one side. So we, we looked at this poster as having a functional side with all the information and then a, a sort of a pretty candy designer side on the other. Yeah, well I think also side. a lot of it is, you know, it's the Society for Typographic right. Arts. So we're focused on, on typography in this instance and really highlighting the form. Um, so zooming in really close on it engages you in, in like, if. You might not see the number 12 at all in there, uh, but those are sort of the restrictions that we use to develop it and look at just the shape of the type itself to say what, what interesting compositions can we come up with that really start to look at the relationship of the type and the shape and the space and the color to the format. That was much better put than what I was saying. <laughs> Thank you. So we did five of those. Uh, we actually wanted to do 12 of those, but uh, we ran out of free people that wanted to do free posters for the SBA, so we did five. And that was actually really nice that we had five different ones because it reinforced this, this idea that we were doing different typefaces and that we're, we were zooming in and making different compositions and give you, give you a different interpretation of these forms. So uh, this next project is called the Lip Living Book Installation. And this is a project that we did at a uh, gallery, Carrie Seacrest Gallery, which is in the West, uh, West Loop. Um, and this project, we were approached by the gallery to just, they have a project space in the back of the gallery in which they said, well, you know, we want you to just take over the space and create a project um, and do something in, that you do. And so, Whenever we start a project like this where it's an empty canvas, our first thought is never to put something that we've already done into the space, but to really think about what it means. Um, what's your relationship to the space? What can we discover about the space? And what, is it, um, you know, what does it mean to be here now in this place and in this time? And, so, and also, you know, what are we interested in and in, in exploring in the studio that may not have a, a very direct relationship to a client work or something like that. So what this project does, and I'll just go ahead and play the video in the background while um, talking about it so you can get a sense of what's going on. But what we proposed is that we turn it into um, a book production facility. And so you, you come into this space and it's open for you know five hours a day and you have a, a camera above above you that is then you know sort of marked off on the floor. And if you enter into this camera zone, you appear onto the screen, and you basically um, become the author of this book. And you can type onto it, and you can you know, do whatever you will with it. But really, a lot of it was thinking about you know what it means to be an author now in the proliferation of on-demand printing and sort of the ease of of being able to produce things like this um, on your own. And also how we are all becoming authors with Twitter and Facebook and social media and 
a lot easier with the, uh, nowadays with the internet to create your own pieces of art and share with the world. So what does it mean to be in a gallery today? Right. The other thing that was interesting about this, so what would happen is that every minute the, uh, the screen takes a capture and then it prints it out on a sheet of paper. So over the course of the five hours, you get a 300-page book every single day. And what it also did for us is we started to think about, well, what actually happens in this gallery over the course of a month from 11 to 5 every day? Is anyone actually in there? Are we just going to get you know, a bunch, like 25 blank 300-page books? And then what does that s sort of say about the state of, of gallery culture right now? And I think it was really OK with that being uh, happening. Um, but what happened, which I was surprised by, is we were looking through sort of some of the stills that you'll see right after this video plays, is that some people started to really take authorship of it and come in here multiple times or come in there and just like really start to see what they could make or do with this and type stuff. And, um, and so actually this project, we're, um, I wanted to mention that we're also revisiting this and, and installing it at the uh, Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center um, this upcoming month. So you'll be able to see it there as a part of the on show. There, there was a gentleman at the end there that, that spent, I don't know how long in there, and he typed a story in there for us, which is pretty strange. Um, not really sure what to make of it, but I was pretty happy with what happened. Okay, so just quickly go through this. This is another project we did um, at the Post Family Gallery space as part of Chicago Design Week in 2010. Um, once again, you know, asking us to just put some work into the show and always asking the question, you know, what is it, what can we do um, to sort of not just put up, you know, a poster or something that we had made before. So this was just like, well, let's put up an image try to recreate an image out of balloons, um, something recognizable. And so we were looking for the most recognizable image in the world, probably the Mona Lisa being one of them. And so we spent an evening blowing up, uh, I think it was 483 balloons into this little box. And, and then, then another day pinning them and up. And then pinning them <laughs> up onto the wall. So. You want to talk about this? Yeah, in 2011, we, we spent two weeks in Urbino, Italy, uh, doing a workshop with the Bergplatz typography with Carol Martens, um, Marin, and Armand, and Leonardo, which are four amazing designers, uh, three Dutch designers and one Italian designer. They run this workshop every year, by the way, if you are interested. And uh, we got there, and they said, welcome. The theme for the two-week workshop is time, go work. Nothing else. Do whatever you want, and we'll meet in three days. So we all went on our own um, and did a lot of experimentation and asked questions, you know, what does time mean to me? And are we exploring personal time or exploring world time? It, had, it could be. It had to be something interesting, but it didn't have any constraints. It could be any medium. It could be a uh, performance. It could be a video. It could be a piece of graphic design, whatever you felt that your piece um, had to offer. So I was exploring with this idea of, of um, memory and how once you, once you pass a moment, you can never go back to it. And I ended up filming my hand so this um, might get a little nauseated. Yeah, but it's we'll a just little nauseated because I'm actually following the pen, the pen. Creative mornings with the with the camera.
it's kind of, this is not really long, but it's three minutes long, and I feel like we're kind of running short. So uh, what I really wanted to do is film it until the ink went down, went out, and then I realized these pens last forever, and it would be like a week worth of me doing this, and I got really tired after filming for even a week of stopping and filming. So I actually got a moment where this pen ran out and the, the, the drawing was really black, so I was really happy and I used that one. But um, we'll move on. <laughs> but I think the, the reason we're showing you this work is because it might not have a specific function, but we're really interested in experimenting. And maybe something that we did back there is going to inform something that you're going to do for a client in, in the future. So it, it's kind of nice to give you, to give yourself the space to fail, to play, to experiment. And that goes back to the words that we, we had on screen. Yeah, and you can see these videos uh, on our Vimeo page. I believe it's just vimeo.com slash plural. Um, and then I'll just briefly go through this because it's about five minutes long. Uh, basically, you know, in the, because we are thinking about time so much, and we're in this sort of Renaissance Italian city, uh, I spent a lot of time sitting and looking at, at the light that moves through these sort of very small um, streets. And so the idea was just to capture all this in sort of a time lapse and make a, a short film about this city and, and its relationship with light. Um, it was funny, though, because when I had set out to do this, I you know, I had traveled only with my point and shoot camera and my iPhone and, and whatnot. And so I was like, well, this is what I'm going to have to shoot it on. And it doesn't have a time lapse feature. So really, it was kind of like this in, endurance performance where I was, uh, you know, had a stopwatch. And every 15 seconds, I would take this photograph for hours upon hours, which is why it gets a little shaky at moments. But, but uh, you know, in the, in the name of art. remember the last night before you finished, you said, I have to wake up at 4 tomorrow. And I said, why? Oh, I want to catch the sunrise and do this. So that was in the name of art. It was. It, that was actually a really funny, quick story I'll tell you, which was to catch that sunrise, I got to this park, which is atop the city um, on this closed. hill. And I get to the park, and the fences are closed, and it's like this 12-foot fence. So I was like, well, I've walked here. It's 4 in the morning, and gotta i got to get the, the shot. So I, I hop this fence, and I know that the, uh, the police will come at 7.30 or 8 to unlock the fences. So I can't be trespassing here. Where am, how am I going to do this? And so I found this public sculpture that was sitting in the park, and I, I sort of put my tripod, and I sat on the sculpture. So it looked like I was just part of this thing. <laughs> and they never saw me. And I was just like balancing on this sculpture from like, Five until eight, and it was just totally uh, absurd. I don't know why I, I would do that. And normally I would say, Jeremiah, do you need help? I can help you, but not at 4 a.m. <laughs> so, anyways, you get the idea um, of this, and you can watch it on your own time. So, I think, um, yeah, there it is. So, thanks so much. Thank you.